Jeff, do you see, you know, the possibility of Russia just retaliating and, you know, point blank, just cutting gas off European? I, I, I don't want to get into speculation of, uh, of those kind of events, but I just want to emphasize that at this point right now, unintended consequent risk, meaning a pipeline outage or something like that, is extraordinarily high. Um, and this is on top of difficulty in getting the seaborne trade up and running. Um, but I think the focal point right now needs to be on the seaborne trade, because that's where the problems are today. Um, you know, we'll leave a big question mark around pipeline flows. When are you expecting that then to get easier? Part, what, what, what's the question? What's, e what's to get easier? So the seaborne trade. When are you? When are you expecting that? If we don't have extra sanctions and actually energy has been carved out, do you expect that to, to ease off a little bit? So yeah, it know, should, but it's just, it's going to take time. It's going to take time yeah. to do it. And let's let's put it in the context. It's five million barrels per day of supply out of the Black Sea. And it's the operational risk, too. So even if they do the carve out, um, you know, if hostilities continue to increase in the region, it just becomes that much more difficult to get the oil out. If you use something like the Iraq war back in you know, 2003, the outage was some, somewhere around three weeks. And that war was very quick. Mm -hmm. um, so we're talking 5 million plus barrels per day. But you know, the total amount of exports is 7.3. Um, this is an enormous amount of oil that has the potential to be disrupted for potentially weeks. So do you expect the IEA to actually um, re release, you know, stock release, and how big and how soon? Um, you know, the, the, the recent noise out of the administration would suggest, you know, an additional release of 50 million barrels per day. But here is the point. That 50 million barrel per day release from back in November of last year, only one third has been taken so far. Let me repeat that: only one third has been taken thus far. So you know you got to finish that tranche before you can start talking about another tranche. And so, what does that mean for? Is there any chance that actually we're going to see a surprise at the OPEC meeting on Wednesday? You know, if you listen to the, the rhetoric coming out of OPEC Plus, they've been very clear in the transparency of the, the increases that should be expected of around 400,000 barrels per day per month. Um, and, um, so until we hear otherwise, I think you continue to expect those kind of increases. The only last other option in terms of supply increases would come from Iran, a deal from Iran. But even last night, the news of that says it's being pushed off into March. Um, you know, I, you heard last week people were saying tomorrow and the next day, the next day on a round. I just go back, if it was such a done deal, why hasn't it already been announced? And the higher oil prices go, the lower the probability of reaching a deal with Iran. And even if you got a deal with Iran, you're only talking 500,000 barrels per day of extra supply, um, which could take months before you actually saw it. Now, I will say there's 80 million barrels of floating storage that could be used, but that's also going to take time to be able to reach market. So, um, you know, we, there are options available here. Um, however, given the magnitude of a potential disruption, um, you know, they still don't look that significant to be able to manage this, which is why we took our price forecast up to 115. Yeah, 115 with a lot of volatility, Jeff. I mean, how are you oh, expecting that to evolve? Yeah, <laughs> how much absolutely. volatility? I mean, the volatility around this should be you know, massive, like we've seen over the course of the last several days. You know, we went up to 105, came crashing back down to what 96, and we're back up to 103 today, back down to 101. Um, so volatility will be significant. Let's not forget what's driving that volatility is low inventories, lack of spare production capacity, strong demand around the globe at this point right now. And this is keeping markets extraordinarily tight and very much too exposed to any potential disruption, which is what's generating that volatility. Um, Jeff, I'm getting quite a lot of questions from viewers. And actually, thank you, everyone who's writing in and who's watching us on this important markets day. But this person, Jeff, is writing in saying, look, what's the probability of oil going to 85 as the Iran deal kicks in and possibly Saudi stabilizes the markets with, you know, Russia, Ukraine cooling off? I know there are many, many ifs, but it, it, how, what kind of probability do you attach to that? Um, I, you know, in, in terms of looking at it, it's definitely a non-trivial probability. And I, the point that we like to say, there's a wide range of outcomes over the very near term. 
But let's just look at this event. This event is decidedly bullish oil medium longer term. What do you think the probability of, of Russia reading its, reaching its OPEC plus quota in June now is? It's pretty low mm -hmm. because the ability to access capital, make investments to get production up. Um, the bottom line, any way you slice or dice it, this is, reinforces that longer term structural bull market in commodities. Just think about, you know, at this point right now, um, you have a big idle pipeline, the Nord Stream to pipeline. This is that redundancy and you know, the deglobalization factor that's leading to, um, to um, you know, resiliency in supply chains, which yeah. is just raises the cost of everything.